Good morning, my name is Melissa Adler and I'm here today talking with Marvereen Cole. Hi Marvereen. Hello Melissa, how are you? I'm well thank you, how are you? Yeah good, excited to talk to you about a very very important topic. Yeah absolutely. Um, would you like to start by sort of introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about what you do? Yeah, so uh, as you know, I'm Marvereen Cole. I am Birmingham born and bred. I'm a Brummie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and as a journalist, I'm known as Marvereen Cole. So I've um, been a broadcaster and a journalist for 17 years now. So I've worked as a reporter, producer and presenter for many of the Britain's most watched and listened to broadcasters, really. So I've done a lot of work for the BBC and ITV in the Midlands. Um, worked as a news anchor for Sky News, so presenting a, a five-hour rolling news show called um, World News and Business Report. I presented news for Five News, Arise News, um, all sorts of different um, channels. But also I've made um, documentaries, so I've made various documentaries for BBC Radio 4. And the one that I think most people will probably have heard about is one that I made two years ago called Black Girls Don't Cry. Mm -hmm. um, which was a half an hour documentary, which you can still hear on BBC Sounds. Um, you can Google it and the, and the link will come up. And it was exploring black women's experiences of mental illness. So I won an award for that, um, Journalist of the Year uh, for um, the charity Mind. They have a, a media awards and I, and I won Journalist of the Year for that. Yeah, it's, um, it's a brilliant... Um podcast I, I listened to it I think about a year ago initially um, and then I listened to it again yesterday to sort of refresh myself and it's um it's, it really packs a punch in the, in the half an hour that it is um covers a lot Thank of ground it's thanks brilliant a lot. thanks um, a lot thanks a lot so I was I was hoping today that we'd sort of be able to talk about about what you covered in that and and relate mm. that to um, the specific experience of black and minority ethnic women at university and yeah. how race has an impact on um, our well-being within education. Yeah and, um, and for me that's really pertinent as well Melissa and I forgot to say I don't know how I could forget to say <laughs> mind you but um, as you know I'm a freelance journalist but I am also an academic so I am um, the director of undergraduate journalism at Birmingham City University. Mm -hmm. So I'm teaching students every day, talking to students every day, and I get a sense of, you know, what's going on. Um, so I hopefully I'll be able to give you some thoughts from kind of my perspective, really. Absolutely. I'm sure you've got um, so much useful information and first-hand experience. Um, I'm doing a bit of research at the moment um, and sort of gathering some qualitative data around the experiences of um, black Asian minority ethnic people in in higher education there's actually not that much quantitative data on it um, there's not been that many studies specifically relating to higher education uh, it's a little bit of a gap in that so I think conversations around it are really important um, yeah absolutely agree. So, agree one thing that you sort of spoke about in um, black girls don't cry um, was around how black girls are and women are less likely to talk about mental health issues. We know that black women and minority ethnic women are more likely to suffer from common mental health issues than white women, but are less likely to access services available. And what I'm really interested in, in is how that transpires into higher education, because we know that, you know, in, in 2020, most universities actually have a really solid um, support service and um, lots of resources available and there's been lots of funding put into that but is that care um, it, it does it specifically recognize the needs of BAME students within higher education what do you think about that? Um, I get a sense that it might not be as culturally sensitive as it needs to be. Um, and, you know, the context really is that um, universities have been made aware, you know, in the last few years of the, the increasing kind of well-being needs of students. So I think that the majority of universities do have well-being support, but obviously to varying levels because it depends on how that support is funded. 
um, mm. how accessible it is for students, how many people are working in that service to, you know, to kind of react to, to student help. Um, I know from my own experience at Birmingham City University, we've got a, a, a great, very responsive team of confidential counsellors that we can refer students to. I am not aware of whether or not there is a proportion in the team of black, you know, African Caribbean or Asian or minority ethnic counsellors within that team. Mm. Um, and, and what I, I think what would be, I would imagine that most universities in their response, particularly to Black, Live, black Lives Matter this summer, would be looking at that because, um, you know, there are particular issues around identity and so on that I think, um, you know, are ones that are uppermost in, in the minds of Black, Asian and minority ethnic students, um, where, you know, someone who has a similar background could be, you know, could offer, offer an extra level of well-being assistance in that regard. I know that um, my university and its response to Black Lives Matter is, is looking at that to see whether or not they can provide um, that sort of care because there are things that ultimately you know you might not be able to talk about or feel happy talking about um, with uh, a white counsellor you know there are certain things that don't need to be explained when you're sitting in front of someone who might have the same cultural background as you so there's a there's kind of you know a mutual understanding in some senses um, and I think that's, you know, is what is what's required. Um, yeah. I actually had a really interesting conversation with a friend about this last night and, and they put it in a really good way. They said it's a bit like going to the hairdressers. If you are um, of Afro-Caribbean descent, you don't go to a white hairdressers because they don't know how to cut your hair. And it's mm. a similar thing with counselling and therapy in that you go mm. to somebody who can, um, you know, in, instinctively recognize your needs without you having to explain everything in that sense yeah and I really liked that sort of analogy for it um because I think it can be quite difficult um for us as as, as non-white people and as non-white students to explain why we want somebody from a similar background to us um to talk to and why why them safe spaces are important um, I think it's I think it's a, a question as well of who you relate to because you know it might not be for everyone yeah. um, and it might be for example that you know if you're a black Asian or minority ethnic student who is brought up pre predominantly excuse me get my words up predominantly in an area that was majority white and your experiences your socialization is with mainly white people mm. you might find you you can easily relate and you can easily talk about anything and you don't feel that there's any issue um and and so you know it, i think it's down to how you feel and and how comfortable you would feel mm. um talking to someone about you know what what are really your innermost thoughts and feelings and, and hopes and fears isn't it that's that, you know that's what kind of counselling is about isn't it absolutely I also wanted to talk about um the notion sort of within um lectures and uh seminars a lot of the time I find and I think a lot of other students find a lot of students that I've spoken to find, the the reading list and and the context the things that we're taught are often written by white theorists and taught by white lecturers and the impact that that has on uh, what that tells non-white students about their place in academia can actually be quite significant I'm a, I'm a strong believer in you can only be what you can see right and mm -hmm. if everything you're learning um is is coming from people who have a completely different place in this in this country or this world to you that actually sends quite a strong message what what do you think about that yeah I mean you know I went through university life a long time ago now quite a few decades <laughs> ago now um and you know I studied business studies and and you know that's what I experienced but at the time you know, I didn't really question it. I think because obviously we live in a country which is, you know, 
uh, led by a white majority. The majority yeah. of people here are, are Caucasian, Anglo-Saxon heritage. Yeah. Um, that's you know you kind of accepted it. And what I what I really am encouraged by now um, has been the work around decolonizing the curriculum. You know, the NUS has been at the forefront of kind of pushing this work along for many years, at least five years. Um, and there are lots of universities around the country that are doing great work in this area um, in terms of, you know, talking to students, because I think it should be a student-led <laughs> yeah. movement as well. Um, a student, you know, and, and a collaboration between students and staff, students and staff rather, um, but a, a lot of work is happening. Um, I think if, if you don't feel that anything is happening in your university, then it is very worth talking to your student union, talking to your NUS reps, um, and trying to start some conversations. Obviously, there's got to be full buy-in from the top, from vice chancellors uh, and deans. Um, but I think, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement ha as well has reinforced the fact that it is time to look at our curriculums. And that means lecturers really have to have an understanding and an appreciation of the impact on students by not seeing themselves or not seeing, you know, black scholars, Asian scholars as part of their, their teaching. Um, and also a need to see um, more um, material that, 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 that goes beyond the the DWEM expertise, the dead white European men expertise, the DWEM expertise that we see. Um, and also, you know, there's value in the fact that the more um, senior leaders, academics from black and Asian backgrounds in our classrooms, all of that's gonna have a huge difference. And all of that's gonna feed into um, what I like to call the achievement gap, not the attainment gap, right? Yeah. Um, because that is something also that is uppermost uh, on um, the minds of you know academic leaders so decolonizing the curriculum really does need to move much faster in universities and I would say to anybody who's thinking oh nothing's happening here try and find out what's actually happening Absolutely. in the university there might be something happening and if not you know join part of the effort yeah what it's, it's interesting that you say that because what I've found um, in speaking to different students um, is that as uh, particularly uh, black students that I've spoke to often feel that the responsibility around um, challenging inequality within education and um, a disbalance in in the context that we're being taught, they often feel that the responsibility to challenge that lies on them. And actually that in itself can have a significant impact on mental health that as a student, particularly someone that's you know, not even 20 years old and is paying a significant amount of money, 10,000 pounds a year to study, to be the one to, to have to challenge um, and have to point things out can feel um, quite frustrating, I think. Is that something you've seen it happening? I I haven't seen that happening, but I do understand why it might it would feel uh, onerous. Mm. But I think um, you know nothing ha change has not happened without activists and activism, right. um, mm. and it doesn't mean that. Um, and I think if you feel that you can try to point things out and use the systems and processes that, that the university ask you as students, you know, in using your student voice. I'm sure uh, at every university around the country is not uncommon to mine in that we're very keen to hear students' feedback. Yeah. Um, and there are various channels. You know, if, if, at my university, you can do it anonymously to, and the course leaders will receive it. Or you can talk to your student rep um, who can then flag that up to, again, course leaders and, and take it further. And, and my university is, is one that says, you know, if we can... And we can instigate change if we can make the, the, your experience better we will try mm. um so and, and i appreciate it's about the environment that you're in it's about the environment and the, and the, and the kind of um, the vibe you're getting from your university and your course and your course director isn't it mm. um but i think if you can stand up 
great but also just do the, do just try and find out what efforts are happening in the university already because there might be pockets of people across different faculties um, at student union from the NUS rep who are making moves and then you can join a team right and 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 most of the sensible universities who are looking at this are not asking the students for all the answers because ultimately it's not down to you for all the answers it's down to the trained academics the experienced That's academics it. right um and most sensible unis will be going um most sensible unis will be going right okay we want to do this what what do you want students and we'll combine that with what we know and what we can do to to to, to change and, and and improve curriculums so i would say give it a try but obviously then exercise self-care because if it becomes too much for you to be part of it you know you can pull away yeah and, and don't feel bad and don't feel bad about that yeah absolutely, absolutely. Mm. yeah so what I'm, what I'm hearing is there are there are processes in place there are systems mm. in place to make sure that student voice is heard um maybe them systems need to be more visible but then yeah. them systems are in place and it and it is important that if um, students are feeling unheard or un unrepresented, that they that they have somewhere to go to talk about that. Mm. Um, yeah, I think decolonisation of, of the curriculum is really, you know, it is incredibly important. And hopefully we'll see more and more of that happening soon. Um, the other thing that I, I wanted to touch on is is stereotypes within higher education and again with different students that I've spoke to this is a really prominent theme that irrespective of um, that student's socioeconomic background or where in the country they've, they've come from often the stereotypes that they're experiencing um, are similar uh, is that something that you've seen amongst students that you recognise within within education, even maybe as um, somebody that's there as a professional, not as a student? And when you say stereotypes, do you mean in, in how in how academics are treating Black, Asian, and minority ethnic yeah. students? Or yeah, and in the, in the... not so much the overt things, um, but the covert things. And again, not necessarily coming from academics, but coming from um, fellow students, coming from peers, um, and, and, and stuff that's often, I think, quite subtle. It's not necessarily another student using a derogatory term against a Black, mm. Asian, minority ethnic student. It's more kind of under the skin than that. Um, from what I, from what I've experienced at university, and from what um, other people that I've spoken to and my friends have experienced at university as well, mm. it's really interesting because it's obviously again about I think the culture within universities um, because you know, and I, again I can only really talk from my own experience at BCU, which is a vocational university, you know, post ninety two. And I've heard, you know, that the, the culture in universities, some red brick universities, perhaps some of, you know, the kind of higher up the league table universities is, is very different. Um, and, you know, for, as an academic, um, and, I, and I work in media department, and I think, you know, all of my colleagues are all very attuned to diversity, and we all see all students you know equally and fairly and we give all students you know that the best opportunity and the best support that we can whoever they are because actually our student body at BCU is, is hugely diverse so we're in Birmingham we're in the second city yeah. the second biggest city in, in the country and, and I think about 49 percent of our 26 and a half thousand students are from black Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds a variety of socio-economic um, backgrounds as well um, you know, and we we treat everyone equally, um, and we don't stand for any um, intolerance on campus in class. Um, and so, you know, it's tough to say whether or not you know other universities are are doing the same. Mm. Um, not knowing, you know, how how you know um, incidents of hate crime or whatever are being treated. Yeah, I think what universities should do, if 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 as a student you feel that university is not strident enough, strong enough in tackling 
inequalities. Sorry, that's my cat. <laughs> hello go on sit on your normal chair <laughs> um i think if you get a sense that you know your voice isn't being heard and that there are inequalities and, and problems that aren't being tackled again student union nus rep course rep um and flag up issues that you have um and uh, to, to try and get a res resolution or to effect change and to get policies in place because your voice as a student is powerful um obviously you've got to consider you know the power dynamics right in that um the way that you present your argument you know if you think about how you write in a paper how you present your argument you've got to be convincing and um speak in a language that you know those senior leaders uh will respond to uh well um in, in order to make your case heard um but yeah, I, I fully appreciate the, the stereotypes and there's the all, all sorts of things going on. There's unconscious bias, you know, against students. There's, um, there's a kind of a, in some cases, a, um, uh, an ex, an, what's the word, what's the word, what's the word? An expectation of low achievement. Absolutely. You know, and a, 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 amongst back. Yeah, yeah. And it's kind of like, it, it, that needs to be tackled, doesn't it? You know, and, and so in many ways, we've all got to look at ourselves um, and our own behaviour and go, what, where does that come from? That, I've got to stop that. I've got to recognise that I'm actually doing it, if I'm doing it. Um, and, and it, it's so, I mean, uh, you know, a, a friend, I was speaking to a friend of mine about this the day and she was, um, and she's an amazingly high achiever. And mm. she said that often people presume, um, and she, she's a black woman, and she says often people presume that she did an access course to get into this oh, university. Oh, yeah. And yeah, it just, yeah. um, and I mean, I've had experiences in lectures as a minority ethnic woman where I've uh, sort of relayed a point perfectly clearly and perfectly calmly and reasonably and instantly been labelled as aggressive and um, yeah. over-emotional, which mm. is very disempowering. And... Mm. That's also a very hard thing to report, no matter how understanding your lecturer might be, when it is so, as, as I said earlier, under the skin and covert like that. Um, mm. It's very hard to, to go, because when, when we're experiencing racism or prejudice, in general, not always, we know that it's racism and prejudice. We know that we're being treated differently um, because of the colour of our skin or the country that we're from. But to point that out to um, a white person, especially when, like you say, there's that power dynamic in place, can be very challenging and can weigh very heavy. Um, mm. And personally, from what I've seen, I'm not entirely convinced that universities, particularly in areas that aren't as multicultural, in areas that have um, less Black, Asian, minority ethnic students, I'm not entirely convinced that they're doing enough to put proper reporting procedures in place to protect students. And I think that often the comfort, and this is quite a, a bold statement, I think, but I think that often the comfort of white students is prioritised over the lived experiences of Black, Asian, minority ethnic students. And I think that's worrying. Mm. Um, yeah. I, I hear you. And you know what? I think um, I just got to reiterate student voice is really key because um, your experience on the course is, 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 is paramount. It's what every university wants to um, ensure, you know, is, is a good one for you. Right. Um, and if it isn't, you need to let them know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If it isn't, you need to let them know. If it isn't, you know, when it comes around to your third year, I know it's, you know, it's, it's, it's three years too late, perhaps for some, but you've got it. Every university has to have its student survey, make it very clear there. Um, you know, but yeah, it's, I think that's really, really important to hear. That's really important to hear and to be reminded of, especially by someone yeah. in your position. You know, mm. and I think often students just need to hear, not even just students, people need to hear your voice does matter and you can speak up and there won't be repercussions for that, actually, you know? Yeah. You know, the, 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 it, with the, when the student survey comes around in the, in the final year, in the January of your final year, right, 
you can there are lots of questions that you're asked about how your entire experience over the course um and there you know reflect on the whole time um and be honest because those have impact that has impact for universities in terms of league tables right um but you know it, it, of course then if you're sitting here listening to this and you're in your first year and you're not happy about things you must flag it up and not be afraid to because there's got to be mechanisms and if there aren't mechanisms for you to say what you feel or to just to kind of make some suggestions then talk to whoever is the most supportive again I, I can only talk about my university but we have there's you know course directors who are me there's your module tutor your you know whoever teaches you your module lecturer you might also have a personal tutor um yeah, most places. and then there are and yeah in most cases a personal tutor we've also got um teams of ex graduates um called student success advisors who've been where you've been right who've mm -hmm been through the whole process and have pretty much have probably been in the same um sort of subject grouping in your faculty mm. so they really understand your experience um and can talk one-on-one -on -one. literally they you know they would have graduated a year two years ago so it, it, you've got people to talk to um to find out how the land lies um and 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 um see where your voice can be heard um I know it's 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 difficult. It is, it's a difficult thing to do. But I also think, you know, one other thing you need to do is choose your course carefully. Mm. Um, I know many of you will be on your course already, but sometimes you you can look to to move course, to move to university if you've got your credits from you know your first year. It's normally you can move you can move first, you know, you can move over to second year. It's not as easy. And it would probably be very hard for yourself to be a you know a third year enter on enter on another course because it depends on how you know both courses map to one another and how much you've learned on the old course to be able to succeed in a new course mm. um and then you know yeah it's i think it's about choosing your course carefully because also you know three years of study and three years of your well-being and enjoyment um, is something that you really have to take time and in investing some research in um, to, feel, to, you know, to, to get a sense of how comfortable you're going to feel um, in a new town, city, um, on a course that's taught well, maybe with, you know, some black, Asian and minority ethnic lecturers on, because there's not many of us about, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> and that has the mix of students that cares about student well-being and student voice all of those things you've got to look at as well as how high is this course on the league tables or where's it going to take me yeah absolutely and i think uh, and I, I'm, I'm sure you'd agree and another thing i'd sort of say to first years that's really important is if it does feel too much you know relying on the faculty making sure you have safe safe spaces um whether that's a society you know the african caribbean society the international mm, student society. oh my goodness you know, melissa the, the acs when i was at de montfort was my lifeline absolutely absolutely it's where and i made all my important. friends <laughs> yeah yeah to have them groups just people you know even um at different sites like people that that eat the same food as you so if you're away mm. from home if you've moved to a different city to be able to meet somebody in the year above you um I, you know i remember a girl coming to me that had moved to this city and she was like where do i go and get my hair done you know mm. and just having somebody you can ask where do I get my hair done? Where can I go and buy this food in this city? Uh, them yeah. cultural things are so important and make us feel secure where we are. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I think it's, yeah. it can only be a positive thing to, to, to be part of them societies. And if there isn't them societies, it, it's not hard to start a union, to go to a student union no. and, and start them. You, I know at my union, you need 12 people to agree to sign up and, and, and that's it. You, it's an official. That's easy like to do as well. Easy enough. Honestly, you, Melissa, you're so right, because, you know, my first year at university at De Montfort was so traumatic. I was, um, I hated, I actually hated university mm -hmm. because it was so alienated and there were clicky groups and basically it was the popular people, or, 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 the majority popular people and a very small section of the geeks and the ethnics. We all hung <laughs> out together. Seriously, yeah. 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 Um, 
and I, I had few friends and where, where life kind of sprung into action for me was I joined the ACS, just met a whole load of people. I was just like, wow, I didn't know there were so many, so many more black people in the university, yeah. like across all years, all courses. And that, you know, without the ACS, I, I might have considered leaving university, you know, might have considered dropping out if it wasn't for the friends who are now... I'm still, we're all still in touch. We're all on a WhatsApp group. There's 10 strong girlfriends of mine from university and I'm talking 20, 30 years ago, right? Um, we're still friends. Absolutely. It's so important to have, mm. to have that. And then when things do happen, you know, I, I had a really rubbish experience at university just a couple of weeks ago with, within a lecture where I felt really disempowered and really, um, you know, there'd been a lot of prejudice, not just against me, but against other students in the, in the lecture hall. And um, I, I had somebody, you know, a peer, another student that I was able to go to after that, who I, I didn't have to explain to him what had happened. He instinctively understood it. And I was able to rant about what had happened. And by the end of it, I felt so much better. And it wasn't important. It, it, I didn't need to go to my lecturer about it because I had that um, connection with somebody else who, like I say, instinctively got it. And that's so important, I think, for new students um, and and yeah it's great to hear that you've still got them relationships and that and that they were a pillar for you as well um, yeah, without a doubt without a doubt don't feel alone mm -hmm. um because you can guarantee that whatever you're going through in the university there'll be someone there'll be someone you can connect with to discuss the the experience about um and the one and the, and the other thing i'll say you know which is kind of linked into my documentary you know, we are, we always feel that we have to be the strong woman, right? Particularly black women, you know, the strong woman. I can get on and do this myself and handle this and I'll be independent. It doesn't serve you. And I continually tell my students across the board because I know students when they are under pressure, feeling um, stressed, they retreat. Mm. They retreat and don't talk and don't communicate. And I always say, just please consider next time. Don't do that, but reach out to me, please. Yeah. And tell me, you know, what's going on, what you're worried about, because I'll do what I can. I'll move mountains to help you. Um, and always after those conversations, a student feels better. I'll, I'll signpost them to the right place, whether they want to speak to a, a, a student success advisor or they want to book an appointment with well-being but you know wrapping yourself up in that ball and going oh my god oh my god oh my god oh my god is is it, it's 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 think it's instinctual i know that it's mm. the first thing we do we all do it but then ultimately you realize it's not getting any better i me yeah. being in this you know stasis stasis equals death right it's not beat it's not it's not getting any better for me i have to reach out um and I know that, Melissa, from personal experience. Absolutely. And, and it is, it, it's an unlearning process, you know, where as women taught to be strong, as minority ethnic women taught to be strong, and particularly for black women, it's this trope of this, you know, strong, independent, don't need to rely on anyone thing. And it's a myth. And to unlearn that is challenging, but often the real strength lies in reaching out. The real strength lies in being able to say, you know what, I'm not coping today. I'm not coping this week and I need some help. And that can be really scary when you've never learned to do that. Um, and particularly when you come from a background where, you know, I know in, in my culture, we're taught you don't do that. <laughs> you do not do that. You do not, as a woman, say, oh, my God, I'm struggling. I need help. You just get on with it suck it up and get on with it so it can be really challenging then within education to reach out but it's so important otherwise you will just you know it's a sink or swim thing right and um with yeah, that yeah. that lies with us yeah yeah without a doubt without a doubt Thank you so much for chatting. I'm aware you've got another meeting and we've run over. It's all um, right. I'm really enjoying it. I could keep talking. I'm <laughs> I know, but I've got somebody else. But um, it was great. It was great. And anytime, because this topic, of course, is close to my heart. Um, okay. Mental health is close to my heart. You know, my, my students, uh, you know, I care so much about my students. I, I always get told that I'm, I maybe care too much. You know, I care about 
how they are and how they're getting on with their work and how their experiences just because I'm, I'm kind of like a bit like an auntie yeah. <laughs> with my students <laughs> everyone needs that auntie at university we all need mm. that you, you will always find mm. it will always be that there for you <laughs> yeah 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 so you know anytime uh, I'm always happy to talk brilliant thanks so much I really appreciate it and um, I hope you have I hope you have a good day I hope your next meeting goes well my pleasure. Thanks, Melissa. Speak again soon. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.